know, we were talking about trying to tune into your own bioregion. Well, Cindy here has these two properties right here in the sleuth. And so she has a, she has all these elements of water and stuff that she's dealing with. I have, this is my backdrop, this is my backyard, a volcanic mountain. I'm down here somewhere. Uh, this is about 10,000 feet. And in the, in the Bible, I, says, I think it says, in the beginning was the rock. <laughs> in the beginning was the word, but I think really it, it meant, in the beginning was the rock, because all soils are really made from rock. That's the parent material from all soils. When volcanic eruptions uh, happen in Hawaii, immediately stuff, what happened in St. Helens? Uh, immediately stuff started growing on the volcanic rock. It was actually uh, Lupin. It was the first pioneer in St. Helens that brought the whole system back to life. So this, this mountain is nothing but a, a rock pile with a thin veneer of vegetation. It looks like it's uh, you know, got a lot of trees on it, but really it's just totally rock piles, all these rock extrusions. You can't see all of the piles, but basically down below it's clay and sandstone where I am. But this is, the, this is what's happening up here. All of this got burnt during the fire. So I almost got burned out. So, um, this summer, right? This summer, yeah, yeah. We had 10,000, 10, 12,000 acres burnt up there. The whole side of the back side of the mountain burnt. Gills ecosystems, uh, you know, there's the scrub oak, there's pinyon juniper, uh, then there's the, the, the alpine forest, there's aspen forest. So when you, when you go on these walks, I go on my walk up there for 40 years, and you know, I can nest into one of these. I can go through these different ecosystems, and that's how we, we look at those and see what's, what's growing there, what the soil's like, what, what birds and animals are interacting in there. And then we take that knowledge and come back to our own forest gardens and then use that as a model. And so in... Uh, Edgar Tolley is one of my favorite uh, gurus. And uh, so this is one of the seams up there on the top of the mountain, near the top of the mountain. These are the aspens. This is a scrub oak. Um, a squirrel probably left a couple of dug firs in the, in the spree there. The only thing that's attacking that is the lichen. Okay? That's actually walk, working like a swale. And look at the edge effect there. So this whole thing just is evolving over time, but this has been there for millenniums. Nothing's growing on it but a couple of trees. The whole thing was a rock pile. So how did it all happen? And, and it's just ta always evolving. Uh, it's magical to be out in that situation where we can sit there and just meditate on what's happening there. And every two or 300 feet, there's another one of these empty seams how does that affect everything? It's perfect. It's just a perfect design of how things should be. Go ahead. Go ahead. And so we, we find our favorite rocks. We don't have to go to Finhorn or Hedgehorn, you know, to, to Scotland. We can, you know, we have these big volcanic rocks, you know. There's one down by the river that I watch and it, um, I sit on it. And, and there's one that's underneath the water that looks like a buffalo head. Uh, and so these are the, every one of the exposures on this has a different kind of lichen. So think about that. On the north side it has one kind of lichen, and the south side has another kind. Of, and there's a little bug that eats the lichen. A little, you know, weevil, beetle. There's the sage over there. Uh, this, ah, sorry. Sorry, uh, the sage, the sage over there is where the deer hang out and get their, uh, you know, eat a little bit of sage and uh, get their gut straightened out, you know. Uh, the scrub oak is where they lay out, they, they bed down. Go ahead. And the different ecosystems with, with uh, pinion and juniper and cactus and the drier areas. And then the, the lush aspens. There's a stream here. So this is all medicinal plants and the stream comes down here. This is where I get my water right there. And then in the aspens, you can go up into here and uh, crawl up in there, and uh, all that burnt down. The whole thing is scorched. So I'll have to wait for it to grow back. This is my, my favorite tree that I went up to for 40, 
three years, nestled right in there, um, and that's that thing exploded uh, along with every tree around there. It's probably a two or three century old tree. Um, it got so hot it just blew up and exploded. But um, that's part of that's part of succession. That's part of uh, the whole thing of impermanence. You know, we're all impermanent, right? We'll all be gone, and that place will regenerate at some point. It's already doing that. So, looking at natural systems, and then how we're going to build our own food forest. Uh, just there are some books out on the table there. David Jackie has uh, um, the two-volume thing, and uh, with Eric Tonsmeyer. Eric was an intern at my place for nine months now in the in 1990s. Uh, he's written the carbon farming book. Basically, this whole thing could be uh, presented as carbon farming. Forest gardening is really carbon farming because we don't uh, we're sequestering carbon all the time. We're keeping the soil uh, covered all the time with mulch and vegetation, uh, and we're growing all kinds of different diverse things. So just to start with uh, a, a simple design, you take the this could be a major fruit tree, and then you would put in your uh, me medium-sized trees, uh, which could be nitrogen fixing or could be a short semi-dwarf tree. And then you start filling in by the numbers, you know, shrubs could be, uh, you know, currants or gooseberries, uh, your medicinal plants in here, uh, your root crops, it could be horseradish down in here, you could have some Jerusalem artichokes, you could have onions and leeks, all of that. You know, the whole the soil food web is very complex, and so can our gardens be very complex. They don't have to be monocultures. They don't have to be at one level. We can use all of the vertical space. We can use all the layering. When you go into a forest, you know, it's not just one level. You know, there's everything, all playing, dancing, like a symphony, right? And they're going to... They're going to cooperate, they're going to cohabitate, um, and uh, there's no magic formula of what you're going to put in. Uh, it's going to be trial and error, and it's going to change. Uh, you can get some good ideas from the books that are out there and what I'm going to tell you, but a lot of it will just be intuition and trial and error. So, um, why, why, why would you... Uh, <coughs> So we're going to get food, fodder, fiber, fertilizer, flowers, fungi, pharmaceuticals, and we're going to have a, a beautiful place to live and eat. And uh, you can create a food forest that's almost has the same ambiance as this forest over here or the forest on my mountain. After a few years, uh, it takes on the vibrations. Uh, you feel anchored. You feel relaxed and feel safe in a food forest. Just like you feel safe in, a, in, a, in the wilderness forest, right? You feel as a, there's something that just kind of calms you down, right? That's, what's, that's what going out of the wilderness is all about. Right? Go ahead. So multiple functions. And they're perennial, so you don't have to plant them. Again, um, in polycultures, you have lots of different species, so you don't have a lot of uh, individual things that insects will attack, a lot of confusion, a lot of diversity. And uh, you know, every plant has many functions. You know, uh, horseradish um, is not only, um, you can eat, it, eat the leaves in the spring, you can even eat them year-round as wraps, like instead of uh, grape wraps, you can use them for wraps. You can, uh, it's a trap plant for grasshoppers. So one of the first uh, plants that the grasshoppers go to is the horseradish. So if you want to find out if you've got grasshopper problems, or if you want to send the kids out to catch the grasshoppers to feed the chickens, do that. You can also um, feed their horseradish to the rabbits. It's one of their favorite foods. And then you dig the root and make um, a horseradish sauce, which is, the old timers never ate meat without horseradish. It's like ginger is to fish. 
So um, it, there's an enzyme in horseradish that makes meat digest in your stomach. And now, you know, you go to a steakhouse, you eat a huge, well, I don't, but you, people would eat a big steak or, you know, two pounds of prime rib, and it just sits in your stomach. It doesn't digest. Um, so it, the old timers knew about that, that, that whole thing. And it's also really good for sinuses. If you have a sinus problem, horseradish will just clear it out overnight. So here it is, this very humble plant. It has all of these amazing properties. And we don't even know about it anymore, right? How many people have eaten horseradish? Well, you guys have. Good. <laughs> Not many people know about it. My aunt gave me my horseradish, my Egyptian onions, and my garlic 40, 45 years ago. And I'm still growing all of those plants in my forest garden. And I'm selling them and giving them away and whatever. Horseradish is used like in like wasabi and mustard. And so two of them have in like, I think we think of it as like a filler because of that because it's cheap and affordable, but it's also good for you. It's not just a filler. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what the Chinese have. The Chinese have known that for centuries. You know, yeah. they've used wasabi. And um, radishes also, any kind of radish is very healing. Good to for the digestion. And uh, daikon radish especially is very, very good. Uh, used all in Chinese uh, cuisine. Very good. Um, this is my food forest here surrounding my tropical greenhouse and my Mediterranean greenhouse, my house, power plant. And... Uh, the outdoor kitchen is there. But see, this is the pinion and juniper here. This is what we're dealing with here is basically, you know, no soil has been built for forever. You know, really the soil just doesn't build there. It's just clay soil uh, because it's, that's just the way it is. Here, we've been hauling in tons of leaves and everything and building soil. That's one grapevine there. There's a plum peach cop there. There's three fruits in one. <laughs> These are, there's about six different kinds of nitrogen fixing trees in here. Russian olive, lots of Siberian pea shrub, false indigo, New Mexican locust, black locust. So these are all mixed in there um, as nitrogen fixing and also for coppicing, for fodder, for food, for chop and drop. Do people know what coppicing is? Pardon? Coppicing? Coppicing. Coppicing is that you grow a tree to cut it back. Uh, so that you can use it for other, u other uses. Now, you can, in the tropics, they do alley cropping. We'll, we'll get into that. So they actually grow rows of nitrogen-fixing trees, and they'll cut them back twice a year, once a year at least, sometimes twice a year, and feed that to the animals or lay it down as mulch. And then when you cut a nitrogen-fixing tree, the root system dies back proportionally. Just like if you mow an alfalfa field, the alfalfa, the, the, the nodules on the alfalfa roots will fluff off, they'll break down, they'll fall off. So you get, that's how nitrogen fixing trees work and they, they like to be cut, cut, that's their pioneers, their mule trees, their mule plants. So they're working for the soil, they're working for us. They don't need a lot of nitrogen. They're building nitrogen for their neighbor. And that's how they do, that's how they work in nature. In the pinion and juniper, you have bitter brush and mountain mahogany, they're both nitrogen fixing. They're not legumes. So they, the deer come through and they'll eat the bitter brush and the mountain mahogany because it's like candy to them. And then they'll manure and then that'll, they're pioneers for the pinion and juniper. And you know, you're, in your dug fir forest, you have uh, uh, alder as a pioneer, right? Okay, what else do we can see here? This, so this is about 200 varieties of of fruits and vegetables, but about 20 of everything, 20 apples, 20 apricots, mm -hmm. different varieties and different placements throughout this little, there's a ravine here, there's a pond here, uh, there's lots of different microclimates. We're, we're in a zone six here at 7,200 7, feet, uh, but right over by the pond it's a 6B because of the microclimate there. We'll get into that a little bit. You know what, you've heard of hugo culture, right? Uh, Seth Holster has uh, you know, coined that word and done some beautiful uh, experiments and uh, he has a beautiful farm in Austria. Well, we did hugo culture way before we even knew what it was. But this, right down in here, there's a deep ravine right here. And uh, I took logs and stumps and stuff and piled them there, you know, 
going to be 10 feet deep for 20 years. And then this is a very steep bank. And then I just took some fill dirt, some subsoil, and piled a foot of subsoil on that. And we'll see some other slides. And then sheet mulched it and put in, brought in some huge rocks and terraced it. And then sheet mulched it and then grew on top of that. So basically, we have this hula culture down at the bottom. And then there's food forest on top of that right now. Jerome, so, can you explain hugo culture just a little bit more? I'm going to write it down so people know what it is. Yeah. Well, basically, you're taking any wood material you have. Seth Holster digs big trenches with a backhoe, and he puts logs in it. And then he covers it up, and he puts more branches on it. We have a couple of different versions of that. Um, then you can, what you're doing is setting up what happens in the forest when a big aspen tree falls down or a dug fir. Um, you know, the mycelium start to eat it away, the mosses, and eventually it breaks down. Well, you just speed it up by burying it because then the microbes and the mycelium act on it faster. And it's a long, slow-release fertilizer. So these are some of the close-up shots. Apples, I think this tree has five varieties of every, every, there's five different branches that have different varieties, and it's a mature tree, so you know, we can get five different varieties. Even the rootstock has, has a, a good apple. It's an Antonocta rootstock, which is a Russian rootstock of full nitrogen. And then this is a, a hollyhocks, grapes, raspberries, grapes, just, just a jungle of things. Um, a lot of things are weeds, but they, we, we cut them back and use them for mulch and feed them to the animals. Just about everything is animal food as well. Uh, we have about 10 different kinds of plums coming out throughout the whole year. So we have you know, succession. We have, so we have plums early, late, mid-season. Mid, mid uh, same with apricots. Go ahead. Pears. Uh, then in the, in the spring, it's full of flowers, bringing in the bee fodder. Uh, lovage is everywhere. Uh, we just got another order for you know, five pounds of lovage for a high-end restaurant in Aspen. Um, you can use that as a salad green early in the, in the spring. Um, you can use it in soups. Uh, it's also an insectary plant because it's, it's a, an umbel. And it's, um, it's a banker plant for all your uh, lace wings and all the snakes and stuff. Uh, so it's a huge, it covers huge areas in my garden. Uh, and I just started selling it commercially again. Uh, it's seven bucks a pound. I sell nettles for twelve, you know, nineteen dollars a pound. So I sell nettles as well, and we eat them, drink them all the time. Go ahead. Mulberries, um, a forgotten crop. Uh, there used to be mulberries in our valley, and they're all they all died out. I have seven different kinds of mulberries, indoors, outdoors. I have a Pakistani one in my Mediterranean greenhouse. It's this big, and it's oh god, it's delicious in the springtime when there's nothing around. That's when it comes out. This is a favorite one. This one here is a variation on a Russian mulberry. It fruits for two months. And it's white and it turns pink and then turns red. Ah, oh, amazing taste. And we graft this one onto uh, mul Russian mulberry rootstock and sell it in our nursery. Three or four different kinds of sour cherries. So there's early, medium, and late. And they're placed at different places in the forest garden. And so you have a long cherry season. And then we have Nankeen cherries, which fruit for about three months. You had Nankeen cherries before? No? The Forest Service gives them, gives them away. They, they should give them away at the NRCS in, their, in their, their, uh, their Forest Service program here. They do in Colorado. You can plant a whole hedgerow of them. So would any of these be for zone four? Man kings are really hardy. Yeah, they're zone four, zone three. In the they're zone three. Mulberries. Mulberries are zone three or four. Yeah, especially the Russian mulberry. It's a seedling. You can uh, you can you can just plant a bunch of them. You can buy them for a buck buck and a half a piece. Uh, this is my plum peach cot. So when you have 200 varieties of different things, what you get is swarm hybridizing. So it, this is as a natural cross of, of, of three different fruits. It tastes like a plum, it tastes like an apricot, and it tastes like a peach. And it has different textures of that. 
Now, there are natural crosses between plum and apricot, and there are some man-made crosses between peaches and apricots, and peaches and plums. But this is a natural one that came from Mirabella plum, peach, and because I can taste all of those in there. Go ahead. And we have about 25 varieties of grapes that I planted 20 years ago or more. And they are mostly wine grapes that were bred for cold climates. And now they, fri they ripen much earlier because of global, global climate change. The reason we're zone six also is, has to do with global climate change. Because uh, it's just getting warmer, right? And it's not that apparent down the valley where they still get the frost sink. We're a zone and a zone a half warmer than they are, just, and we're higher. Because that mountain has the sun on it all day long, okay? And that, those rocks are heating up that air, and that air comes down at night. You know, the night thermals come down, the day thermals go up. Think about that. It's just a big breath out and a big inhale back in, right? <laughs> Peaches. Go ahead. More blue dancing plums. This is the most prolific plum we have. Mid-season pears. Guess good. That's more, more pears and apples. Um, and we do a lot of air heritage stuff, too. We have a lot of heirloom apples that we get from around the world. and. I have one, some from East Germany, and, uh, but just out of catalogs or good old heirloom varieties, you know, they're usually you know, from Seed Savers Exchange, different, you get signed wood uh, from all over the country. And then you have the heritage apples that are grown, like the ones right out here, that have been grown by old homesteaders. Up there, sometimes 120 years old in our valley. The Italians brought them in from from back east, or they even brought them from Italy. Uh, and they set up their orchards in every one of their homesteads when they settled in the early 1900s, and they're still there. Some of the trees are this big. Good varieties, some of them really great varieties. They have cider apples, cider pears, things you won't find anywhere. So we take those and graft them onto rootstock, rootstock that will leave, live in another 100 years. So that's another thing we could do in the spring is we could, we could start collecting all of these old trees up and down the valley here, up around here. So, you know, everybody has an old pear tree. And so if it's a really good one, why not let's set up some nursery stock. Let's get 50 pear root stock, 50 apple root stock, and gra graft all of those on there, tag them. And somebody sets up a nursery. It can sell those heirloom trees, those heritage trees. Uh, we have another article out, Peter wrote, Peter Brain, Peter Bain wrote, uh, and it's on our website. It's called Every Tree ha Has a Story, and it's about our heirloom, and it'll be, um, it'll be on our website, or you can email us. That's the one I just turned out is about our golf course project there. Yeah. So every plant has many functions, of, um, and they, they fill a different... Uh, need during in the forest garden. The overstory takes up that space and it gives us fruit and, and uh, cyanwood. Gooseberries will be mid-story, maybe even lower. Um, Siberian pea shrubs could be mid-story and the nitrogen fixing fodder and chop and drop. Asparagus could be fitting in there somewhere too as, as a perennial vegetable, right? Red clover is a ground cover. It fixes nitrogen and you can use it for teas and for animal fodder. Echinacea is a cut flower, medicinal plant, uh, and bee fodder. Uh, comfrey is accumulator in medicine, so, and, and animal food. So look at all those different uses and, and how they fit into this whole mosaic uh, of, we're, we're so lineal in our Western Occidental mind that we can't, grasp the, the whole idea of how a real natural system works. You need to start and sit in the forest and see how all of these things interact. And then we come back and we try that out in our gardens. 
and forget about the tidiness for now, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like let it go crazy for a while and uh, see what happens and then you can rein it in. So. Yeah. I let it go crazy for 20 years. <laughs> and now I'm reining it in. <laughs> I just let my grapes crawl up the trees and uh, now I brought them back down and put them on a trellis. Everything changes, techniques change, but let it, let it go for a while. Go ahead. Okay, this is a pear tree hanging over. This is where the double sun is off of this pond up under this area. Uh, and you'll see it on another slide where this is double sun up here. Um, this, that's good. Uh, so the Siberian pea shrub is uh, all of that stuff. And it's, uh, in Canada, it's used as a hedgerow for the canola fields. Miles and miles of Siberian pea shrub. And they, the old timers used it um, as a staple survival food. They ground it up and put it in flour and made bread out of it. But you can take the pea itself and cook it just like a bean, like a mung bean, boil the water off, pour the water off, put more water on and boil it again. It takes that oxalic acid off of it and you can eat it just like a mung bean. And the peas are edible for all kinds of animals, pigeons and chickens and stuff. Uh, Astragalus is a, a vet. And it's a medicine and uh, fodder, immune system. Uh, we, it's one of our tinctures. We tincture it. Clover, very common plant, but very um, dandelions in there too. Uh, it's one of our tinctures as well and one of our teas. Go ahead. Echinacea, I just talked about that. Catnip, it's in the back there. Accumulator, clover, or uh, comfrey, all those things. We have about 300 comfrey plants uh, just everywhere. Yeah. And I cut it back with a machete four times a year. It goes up this tall. Yeah. Horseradish, we talked about that. Garlic here, that's the seed of garlic there. Garlic is a weed in my garden. And uh, Drusum artichokes. I just found out this is one, one of the favorite rabbit foods. So right now we're cutting those down. That's Drusum artichokes. We're cutting it down, uh, feeding it to the rabbits. It's a good fire break, a wind break, dust break along the road. Uh, it's a very useful plant. We're going to be planting some today along a fence line. Very useful plants. Very invasive. So if you're going to be planting it, and make sure you don't put it in your garden. Put it on the roadside or put it somewhere where you can keep it from spreading. But it was a survival food for, um, for Native Americans. They used it. And then the old, old settlers used it. After their root cellar was all empty, they went out and dug up their Jerusalem artichokes. And that's what they lived on. <coughs> These are some gills. A guild is basically just an accumulation of, of Plants, it's sort of our version of a companion planting, but it's a little more complex. It's just not like just the three sisters. It's the ten sisters, okay? So ten things can get along together, right? That's what we're trying to do here, right? So all these are put into a understory, overstory, midstory, and they're all working together. And they're all useful. And they're all coming in to fruiting and harvesting at different times. And they're like, another phrase is called phases of abundance. Each guild has a phase of abundance. And the whole forest garden fluctuates and has different phases of abundance over time, over years, over seasons. So it's, it's that ebb and flow of life that we forget about, that we try to control, right? And we can't control it. When in, you can't control what's happening in a forest, you know. You really shouldn't try to control your gardens. You just plant it and see what happens. You know, if you are in a, in a subdivision, um, you know, a lot of times you're, you're not going to be able to do your front lawn because that's just going to piss your neighbors off. Uh, you know, do your backyard. But, and you can, 
you know, you can do it with moderation. She has a, a beautiful backyard garden. Uh, you know, you're always going to find somebody who's going to find fault with, you know, with that, you know, because you cut your, you know, you, you took your lawn out, right? And it's going to decrease the, the real estate value of their property or something like that. So those are the issues you have to deal with. Um, and every community is going to be different. There are places where they tore all the backyard fences out and took everything turned into garden. That was in Davis. That was about the time when Village Homes was going on. Uh, the guy who ran the permaculture activist was living in one of these neighborhoods where they, everybody took their fences down and they just planted wall, you know, the whole backyard was, 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 was gardens, you know, forest gardens. So depending on, you know, you just have to feel it out and see what you can do. And, you know, obviously you don't want to, I'm out in the wilderness, so basically I, I do get uh, people are pissed off at me because you know, it encroaches on the road. We have to cut, we have grapes, trees coming out onto this narrow road. So I had to cut them back because they were, they were pissed off that it was blocking access. So I used to let my, tr my grapes crawl up the trees for 20 years. And I, I stopped that because um, I was told by a, a vineyard expert that eventually they're going to just peter out and they're not going to do well and they're going to die. And the other thing was that they were pulling down trees and um, and then the other thing was that the bears, uh, you know, I picked the fruit off the trees, but if I left just a little few grapes up on the tree, on the, on the vine, it was up on a tree, the, grape, the bear would go up and get the grapes and break the tree down. So there was a reason, you know, so I changed that and just took all the grapes back off and put them on trellises. So I reined myself in on that one. And uh, I do a lot more pruning now, and so I'm starting to bring it back in. I just let it just... That's kind of that flushing out and then bringing it back in. It's uh, what kind of watering methods? Drip, drip, drip systems, yeah, yeah. And I use pond water exclusively for a lot of stuff. I, I put the pond water on you. I don't discriminate or I don't differentiate between forest gardening indoors and outdoors. Our, our greenhouses are forest gardening. We don't do annual <coughs> gardening in most of our greenhouses. This is a tropical forest garden, like you would find if you walked into um, we're doing that tonight. It'll be, if you walked in, in your backyard in Costa Rica, this is what you'd see right here. You know, this, uh, this is um, Gonacola, which is we, the nitrogen, it's, a, it's a medicinal plant. This is comfrey. Uh, this is papaya. This is lucaina. These are our coppicing ones. That's been cut off there. And it's, it's uh, used to chop it off. That's lab lab bean. There's a velvet bean back in there. Uh, there's some uh, Cuban oregano here. This is um, citrus over in here. Uh, there's Thai basil. This is where I do my worm farming. This, um, there's about a 10, 10 inch depression there in my pathway when I fill with organic matter, just like we're going to be doing today in our individual worm farms. Then I have a custom made pallet that sits on top of that. And then a piece of plywood that I found at the dump. And those are about seven or eight years old. They're still standing up. So I have a no compaction in my greenhouse. And for seven years, I harvested the worms in there. Now I'm leaving it. So this food forest over here, this food forest can tap into that, that vein of fertility and softness. It's worm castings. And it never gets taken out. I just keep adding more material. Think about that. Instead of having a concrete pathway in your greenhouse, you have nothing. You have this. You have this bed of worm castings. Then the worms can come in and out. Uh, and the, when you water that, it makes worm tea, right? That goes out into the food forest. I just changed that strategy because we mine. We, the, the, we have two of these. One in the bottom bed, which is not connected to a food forest. It's connected to an annual bed. I mine that one now for worm castings and cell worms and for nursery. I leave this one for the food forest. And I've noticed that uh, we have a lot less disease problems and the, the garden is doing much better up there now since we've given, it, given something back to it, you know. This is the, we'll see more of this during the other PowerPoint. There's pomegranates over here, passion fruit. These are some of our harvests. This is a yacon, 
which is a tropical Jerusalem artichoke, different kinds of grapes. Cucumbers are some of the yields. Uh, different kinds of cucumbers. Tomatoes. This is the fig I was just eating a couple nights ago. This is a peach sweet honey fig. Uh, different heirloom tomatoes. We have different greenhouses. This is our main uh, cash crop in the greenhouse is Spilanthes. It has 30 different medicinal properties. It cures 30 different things. And we'll have an email on that. This is some salad greens. This is another harvest of, from the food forest. This is what's happening now in my teaching room which we have all the food um, from our place and other places. We dry a lot of stuff. Teas, nettles, mints, fruits. Okay, up at the very top, now this was all a really steep ravine. And how do we, how do we transition from a totally unusable space to a, to a food, first to an annual garden for five years, and then to a food forest by terracing. What did the Incas and the, and the Chinese do? And they terraced these really steep hillsides with huge stones. I brought these in, dropped them off on the road, just paid for the gas, rolled them down here with three people and two bars, and then you made sure that that surface was the one you wanted to drop in there because you couldn't move it if once you got. So these are a bunch of terraces all the way down to that place where I was putting all the rocks, or all the stumps, remember? Down here. So we grew annuals in this, but we didn't grow annuals the way you grow annuals. We grew annuals by broadcasting and, and sheet mulching first. We put in some subsoil, then we sheet mulched it. Then we grew annuals with arugula, just broadcasting it. And when the arugula was ready to finish up and go to, we pull it up and lay it down. And then we planted another crop, sheet mulched it again and plant another crop into it. So we're constantly building soils. No composting offside, no tillage. It's a, a no-till soil system. And then mm -hmm. um, the, next, the next slide. So if you wanted to direct seed into that, underneath that is some residues. And I just took some recycled soil and threw it on there and then broadcasted another crop in there. Same here. These are all now food forests. And that's a food forest down there. But for five or six years, we annual cropped it. In order to build the soil. So well, just because we needed actually more annual beds, too. But, we, but why not build the soil? You could, you could have planted perennials right in it, too, in the beginning. But we had a whole food forest already. This was kind of like on the corner of the garden. We didn't have any. We ran out of annual places. And now I don't have any annual places. I don't have any annual beds. I just don't have any more place. It's all food forest. Once you plant a, some food forest, it just closes in. You have closed canopy, and there's not much room to do it. So I have to move up onto the swales if I want, or I just don't grow annuals that much. Go ahead. And then it all goes to sleep. I mentioned that underneath the snow here and underneath the six, ten inches of mulch, the worms are still living. Microbes are living. Uh, it all wakes up back in the spring, and it all goes on its own again, just like any fruit tree. And um, the ducks are swimming in their dinner. This is the double sun of the pond here. These are the big stones over on this. There's all kinds of tender stuff over here, blackberries, Asian pears. Things don't do as well. Uh, they wouldn't do as well on the other side of the forest garden because they get double sun here. Uh, I have three ducks now. We have lots of snakes. Um, they eat the mice and voles. Lots of biodiversity with uh, integrated, uh, lots of flowering plants for the beneficials. Something's always flowering for the pollinators and the beneficials. Lacewings and ladybugs and uh, beneficial wasps. Yeah. And so how do, you, how do you get the mulch in? Well, this is an early shot of, I bring in truckloads of leaves and mulch, wood chips, sawdust sometimes. Uh, we grow comfrey, we coppice. All the Siberians and indoors, we coppice, coppice, lay it down. And a lot of stuff runs through the animals. This is uh, sweet potatoes. We grow them mainly, uh, you can stir fry them. Uh, the Chinese use sweet potatoes a lot in their cuisine. 
we, we have them for the rabbits, and we have all kinds of different things that grow in. They eat banana leaves, they eat all the nitrogen fixing, the comfrey, horseradish, a lot of stuff that we, you know, any spent vegetables, anything that has, uh, you know, been eaten or maybe has a few aphids on it that you want to pull out, you just pull it out and give it to the rabbits. So it cycles back into the system. It's a closed loop system. And then you clean their litter, you put a lot of litter down, straw, and you get that straw and rabbit manure and rabbit urine, that goes back into the worm farms and back into the mulch system. So again, you were talking about, um, you know, using your cows to uh, manure on the wood chips, the same thing. That you're scaling it up, right? It's common sense, you know. Carbon nitrogen, carbon nitrogen. And you're using an animal and you're finding your own food, you're growing your own food. You're not buying rabbit pellets that are contaminated with herbicides or hormones, right? You know, we don't, we, we don't buy any chicken food. We, should, we can bring in spent grain from the brewery, cut everything, keep our animals down to a small size. All over the world, they do cut and carry. That means you're cutting something and bring it to your animals. You don't let them go out. We can let our ducks go out and our turkeys go out, but not our chickens or our rabbits. Sometimes I let my rabbits go out, and at the end of the year, I can shoot them. You know. Go ahead. Go ahead. What, what kind of predators do you have? We have every predator imaginable. Uh, and we, you know, we, somehow we dance with them. Uh, we have weasels that will wipe us out sometimes, but I had a skunk the last couple of weeks. I had a skunk that I was just, you know, he would, he would come, up, go on, come under the board of the kitchen. He'd look at me, and I'd, I said, God, what are you doing here? And then I'd go over there, and I'd show him, and he was, he was going to go like this, and he was going like this, and he was going to go like this. And, so I, and, so I, and, and he was in the chicken house when the chickens were out there, and he didn't kill them. So, like I say, it, it's somehow just this, this harmonics, just when you, when you just, when you don't fight at all, you know, when you don't try to kill everything and control everything, sometimes it all just kind of its way. works its way out. And the same with the bears. You know, we got through the bear season without having to kill a bear and without losing major trees. And we shared some of our crops with them. You know, now they're going to, they're gone because there's nothing in the house for the eat. They'll go to sleep. Who knows? We'll, we'll get maybe next year. We'll get a dog. And, you know, whatever. We'll figure that out. You know, it's like, don't worry about it. That's, yeah. You have so much bounty there, so much to harvest. Do you have a certain mindset if you don't have enough time to harvest it all, or to give it away, or to sell it? Is it okay to let it? Just stay on the tree and rot? No, 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 not, not for the bears. You've got to get it off the tree. That's the challenge, because if you don't get off the tree, they'll break the tree down. But that's the only problem. You, if you didn't have bears, you could just let it fall on the ground and bring in the pigs or something, or bring in or let the deer eat it. But, I mean, if you didn't have, I can't have the deer in my place either. They don't come in my place. They respect my place. Well, for example, when my class was visiting his uh, place two weeks ago, we picked tons and tons of plums. Yeah, I had, I had a college <laughs> class come in, 15 people to pick my fruit, yeah. but you didn't pick it all. No, you, you, didn't, <laughs> you, you, didn't pick, you didn't pick all the Italian plums, and I lost my Italian plum tree, the, the, the major one. Well, it was one of your groups, but they, they, they didn't pick them all. See, they were supposed to pick every fruit on the tree. And I had another guy came back, and we picked fruit all day long, to make sure every piece of fruit was gone. Yeah. And that was, that's the challenge. But, but see, you know, you know we, we tried it. We, now we're selling some of it. Uh, we got it all off. So, you know, it is a challenge. You, you know, abundance is a, is, is a problem sometimes, right? Yeah, that was my question. Yeah. The stress of the abundance. And whether you start downscaling if you made it too big, mm -hmm. that, or, you know, or whether it's okay yeah. to just leave it on. It's not. We know a lot of people in town will have apple trees and they'll never use them. And they just fall on the ground. But that's an opportunity for people to go and glean. And for people who don't have fruit can go and get free fruit. And I do that a lot. I mean, I, I leased a pear orchard in Paonia last year, and we gleaned uh, you know, several thousand pounds of, of pears and got them to 20 different families. And I sold a, two, a thousand pounds of pears. This year, I just went and got 10 boxes of my own. But that's another thing we could do. We could set up that, uh, a hub. And, and there was a group in Durango that got a three-quarters of a million dollar grant to just do that, to go and get 
fruit from, and vegetables from different farms that aren't using them or that have extra and then organize um, pickers in a food hub and distribute them to hospitals and schools. And there's USDA money to do that. So there's a, if there's a problem, there's a solution, right? My food forest is way too big. I mean, I would, I, you know, I just filled the whole place up. And, you know, you know, I can't keep up with it at some point, you know. So, you know, if you had a smaller area, I would just be more, you know, selective plant, you know, one apple tree, one pear tree, one, you know, keep it small, keep it simple for the first couple of years until you figure it out. This is, again, having ducks um, come in and they roam around. They're getting worms in. This is a, a Carpesian walnut. We have black walnut. There's a big Reliance grape that covers this entire chicken house. This is a rabbit and chicken enclosure. It's called a straw yard. Uh, and we picked these beautiful grapes off of the, and it provides shade for the chickens, but it provides a shell trellis as well. Um, it's one of the hardiest grapes there is. These are Siberian pea shrubs. And this is a uh, lovage in here. And there's a uh, green gauge plum over here. Um, so the, the ducks can kind of roam around and they go back to the pond. Uh, they're eating slugs and worms and they're getting some of their food and they're manuring in the mulch. Uh, so they're not as destructive like, uh, like turk chickens are. Here's how we're farming worms. I still farm worms here in this pathway. And we're digging it out and selling. This is a, a, a winter crop of salad greens in this. This will go into um, eggplant and basil in the summertime. This is my annual rotating bed. And this is all the forest garden with their biocontrols along the edge. Go ahead. This is where our, our red worm production in there. So we have uh, two 70-foot uh, walkways that we harvest worms in. OK, alley cropping. Uh, this is one example. This is fruit trees with vegetables in between the alleys. OK? This could be nitrogen fixing trees. And then some other kind of crop could be corn, or it could be beans, or it could be uh, vegetables, or it could be a, a perennial raspberry crop or something. Okay, lots of versions on this, and there's all kinds of books out. Eric Tonsmeyer's book on carbon farming has lots of information on <coughs> agroforestry techniques. And we did one project at the at the steamboat uh, project that we did at, at Elkstone. Um, we did about two acres of alley cropping there just by using uh, the Forest Service uh, seedlings. We did this design during our design course. Uh, we're up to like 31 years of doing the design course. Go ahead. And so after we did the course, I took the, some of the people out and we planted out the, uh, we planted these things out into five gallons in the spring and then in the fall, we set up the, the, the transit and laid out the contours, had the uh, auger drill the holes, and then we already had mycelium and worms in the cans, and they went into the holes. These were different, these are going to be cash crops or something in between here, but these were nitrogen fixing trees and fruit trees mixed. So that's how we did that. They didn't really follow up on this project. Uh, they didn't put a lot of energy into this one, but we did that much of it anyway. So here's how it works out in the tropics. And um, so you have these contours, and then you have double rows of nitrogen fixing trees, or it could be elephant grass or veneer grass or lemon grass to hold the contours. You know, because you don't need to have rocks, you know, everywhere. And you know, so you can grow your own, um, your own stabilization. And then in between, you alternate beans, cocoa, upland rice, citrus, peanuts. This would be something else. This could be rice next year. Uh, you keep going up your corns over here. So you have your annual and your perennial crops on the contour. Nothing leaves the soil. All the water stays on. All the nutrients stay on. These are all coppiced for fertilizer. And you leave this in, in forestry here. And you have your major forest garden crops up in there, your tropicals. 
and your, your wild things like uh, mulberries and uh, jackfruits and stuff and uh, mangoes and stuff up in here. This is a little nursery. You could have your animals in here. This could, this could you could do this anywhere. In, in temperate zones. Yeah. This is another example of how it plays out in the tropics. These are uh, cassava. These are perennial vegetables in between nitrogen fixing trees. This is uh, Lucaena coppiced. And this is a, a winter crop, a drylands crop of chickpea. Now that, in the summer, that would be rice or corn. And they rotate between winter and summer crop. It could be lab lab. So you're always growing something. You're always, and this gets coppiced. So it's a perennial system that's always feeding itself, right? And it's, it's alleyed so that you can go in with tractors or oxen and carts to harvest it. It's not random. It's lineal. That's what's really important about this, is you scale it to, for, for machinery. And if, what strip cropping was all about back in the old days, remember? When you'd have alfalfa, and you have it, especially on the contour, you'd, and then you'd have some rice or some, some barley, or you'd have some oats, and you'd go back into alfalfa, and they would rotate. They got rid of all that stuff because it was too much trouble, right? It was beautiful to see. Have you ever seen strip cropping? No. Here's my golf course project. 20 acres of edible food forest on a golf course in between the fairways. The fairways on both sides, there was a food forest planted with trees and shrubs and, and then wildflowers. Go ahead. That was a golf and fishing club. These are the fairways and greens, these are the food forests. And you can see how it really flushed out and, uh, in a, almost a year, it just was a jungle. And uh, I coined the word cosmic soup and, the, and bio islands. Basically, these were biological islands where, you know, lots of activity, lots of diversity, lots of uh, habitat for beneficials. Now they, now they call it, what do they call it? Well, they call it, uh, what's, what's the next, uh, the woman who's coming and do this? A pollinator garden. Okay, so they copied a lot of what we did here. Uh, and it, it, now the NRCS gives grants to do pollinator plantings, okay? <laughs> so they got this idea from basically what we were doing there. Uh, and this is groundbreaking at the time. And the only reason they did this is that the, the town did not want to have another golf course that, that was pesticide laden. And so they, they insisted that they hire me to work with them to design a, a sustainable golf course. And this is how we, I spent six months with a, a nursery man designing all the gills and the 20 acres. And then we spent four years planting and maintaining uh, and trying to, trying to train the turf management people who weren't uh, open to it at all. And eventually, none of the staff was open to it. The superintendent had nothing, didn't want to touch anything. He didn't want anything. We fought tooth and nail to do it, even though we had the permission. And eventually, they got rid of me. They fired me. I was like their economic hitman. <laughs> you know, their whore, sort of. And uh, they fired me. Uh, and even the council wouldn't stand up for anything that the original agreements that they wanted to, um, that they agreed on, they, they just forgot about those. And then about five years later, the original superintendent moved on and the sub-superintendent became the original superintendent, became the superintendent. And he, he was a permaculture dude. He somehow got converted to permaculture and he brought me back in for a year. And so I hired an intern to do a kind of a, a moderation or a, a, an assessment of where the bio islands were. And that only lasted about six months. And then another superintendent, then he fired him, and another superintendent came in, and then they just got rid of me. They wouldn't they want me to come on the golf course at all. And now I hear, this is like 10 years ago, now I hear they're interested in getting back into it again. <laughs> so, so maybe I'll go there and... Uh, you know, start up this whole process again. It's just <laughs> amazing. 
Huh? This is, yeah, this is right, we're two miles from Basalt. It sounds like that area. Yeah, yeah. It's a <laughs> Roaring Fork Club. Yeah. And then I, we actually designed, I designed, preliminary designed four more courses, two in Palm Desert and two in Utah. And they never got built, but I got paid for one of them. Uh, we were going to build four new, four golf courses using this Bile Island concept. Uh, it just never took off because of the herbicide companies. They did not want to give up their fertilizers and their pesticides. So we had them on a really short list of pesticides and herbicides, and they did not want to hear that. The superintendents have a book this big of Scott fertilizers and stuff. And the golf course, you know, you know if you have a product, if you, if you have a technique or something that, that takes away somebody's product that they're going to be selling, they're going to get after you. you know, they're going to discredit whatever you're doing, or they're going to get rid of you. Because they don't want to lose their bottom line. They want to sell their product, right? If they've been doing something and it worked for them, they're not going to change uh, unless they're forced to change. And they weren't forced enough to change. Yeah? Uh, it was very bitter for me to, 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 have, to have to go through this whole process and not have, have the town stand up. And, um, and then I did a video on natural weed control. And it's still out on YouTube. It's called Natural Control for Noxious Weeds. And, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble for that, too, because of the herbicide companies. Because, you know, again, suggesting natural ways to do it, biocontrol, which they downplay and discredit. Uh, you know, all the natural controls, like mowing and goats and all those things are in the video. Those are taking <laughs> their product and leaving it on the shelf, right? They're not using it as much, you know? So that's, that's what you're up against when you're fighting, you know, this issue of uh, alternate controls for sex. But, you know, we have, to keep, we have to keep after it and stay on top of it. Otherwise, you know, we'll be uh, inundated with it. We have a fair amount of gnat weed. Pardon? We have a fair amount of gnat weed. Can you talk to yeah. about bio control? Well, there's plenty of bio control for that. So you'll give you an, an email that has the gnat weed bio control and all the bowel control for um, leafy spurge and for thistle and it's all <coughs> been published by the USDA. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing these bowel control programs and then they put them on the shelf. Yeah, it was all developed in Montana too for leafy spurge. What, what era? About what time frame? Were uh, it was about 20 years ago. But it's all relevant, still on the internet. I have hard copies of everything. She has all the connections on an email that we gave her. You can still give that for an athlete to buy Yes. There's, uh, in my video, there's a scientist at CU that has seven different insects for napweed. OK? The property of the is just. And he's our, fa he's our main scientist in the video. Okay. Ted ceased it. And I think he still runs a program there. And uh, when, I, when we went to see you to, to show the video for the first time, they, the, the goon squad came in and, and diffused our message. And, you know, it's, it was really amazing. They came in, you know, they hired, the hired guns came in from NRCS, and, and they brought some professor in with a pile of stuff that said, oh, this is no good. This, this is never work. You know, so they, they, were, they were all ready for me to, you know, you know. I was lucky not to wind up in a dumpster. <laughs> well, we have a succession plan now, but uh, I'm 77, and I'm, we have a succession plan, but it's not going anywhere. We just don't have the funding to, um, to make it work. I hired a grant writer, but we're kind of st stuck treading water right now. You know, I need to turn this over to younger people, but, and we're trying to turn it over in some sort of a cooperative, you know, um, livelihood program, but th that's difficult to do in this country. Uh, we've been struggling to do that. I have one livelihood nursery woman, but she's maybe moving on. So it's not working. Uh, we'll, we'll see how, how it goes. I mean, I, need to, I don't have any heirs, so I need to turn it over to somebody who continues this for another 50, 100 years to what I'm doing here. And the community doesn't seem to think it's that important. You know, it's not 
I'm not getting any support from the community. And even though I you know, have pretty much support from international, but I'm not getting any support from the local community. Because they're more status quo. They want to, you know, we're, we're like, you know, Aspen Valley is all de about development and ski industry and real estate and, you know, high end everything, high end everything, just moving fast, you know. So what is your ideal succession plan as far as how? Ideal would be to have, you know, two or three people running businesses out of there and having a nonprofit that would be funded enough to keep the place going. One of the livelihoods would be education, one would be nursery, the other one could be plant sales and tinctures. But I, I'm struggling with all those just to keep them alive. Uh, sell a few tinctures. Now the nursery is working foul, but she may not be there because of location and other things. So um, it's going to be, it's a difficult site because it's remote and it's not really geared for agriculture. I mean, we're just, yeah. we're on a, on a ridge with limited resources and um, I'm putting uh, $100,000 into my cabin with a matching grant uh, to see if I can get that infrastructure improved. And I'm not sure how that's going to play out. I may move up to there to the cabin and retire. But I need to downsize my activities uh, so that I don't burn myself out completely, you know. Uh, and one way I could do that is do more teaching and traveling. Let's go on. I'm going to finish this uh, slideshow. So again, the, these, are, these are just, they turned out to be beautiful and, and very lush ecosystems, but the Gulf people didn't love it because if the ball fell in there, they, they could never get it. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't like the clover, they didn't like any of it. You know, they just, it never, none of it just made any sense to them. But this is how it just filled in, like a totally, this is in a year. And you know, and the agronomist missed they used the wrong grass on the fairways, so they had to spend another year or six months to open the golf course. And I was selling lots and cabins because of the bio islands. I was driving around with Michael Eisner and you know CEOs and touring the bio islands when the golf, when the grass wasn't even growing because they had these agronomists that thought that they knew what they were doing. And my partner and I were just laughing, we were standing up on the hill and looking down at the grass that wasn't growing and they couldn't open the golf course. So we had our bio islands, and they gave us all the shitty soil up there, right? <laughs> all the good soil went down there, but they couldn't grow, still couldn't grow the grass because they specked out a grass that was for Montana and not and the wrong grass. So they had, the next year they had to plow the whole thing up and plant a different kind of grass. And it, so it's amazing how, it's, it's really funny how this whole thing goes. So they, these were the, the plantings around the pond, and we had, Currants, gooseberries, and elderberries in here, and the ducks and uh, geese came in here. Um, it's a very, very lush ecosystem. Cattails came in on their own. And this is going back to this is my, um, this is uh, what I call Polish hugo culture. And so we're taking the, limbing up the trees. We got a grant from the Forest Service to reduce the fire danger in our in our pinion and juniper forest just above the house, an acre. We have a couple thousand dollars. Laying that down on the contour and then digging a trench behind it. So that's basically hugoculture, our, our version of it. And then we, we can plant into here, okay? It stabilizes the bank. It keeps all of the water and duff and pine cones on the, on the thing. And it takes the drought, uh, minimizes the drought effect on the whole acre. These are some of the really steep terraces that we work with. And these are all growing plants now, you know. Tall trees and shrubs and other things. We even grow vegetables in here. So you've heard about, you know, somebody mentioned uh, bug out baggers, um, what do you call them? Uh, the survivalist people? Peppers. Peppers, okay. Yeah. So, so if you're gonna go, you're gonna be a pepper. How are you going to grow your food when you go out with your, with your pack? Are you going to just eat marmots? Uh, uh, or are you going to be able to grow? We can teach you how to grow vegetables in the wilderness with this technique right here. All you have to need is a little fold-up shovel and bag of seeds that we'll sell you. 
And, some, <laughs> and so you can, you can grow this kind of production, you know, this is garlic and fava beans and, and all this, you know, right out in the wilderness, you know, not, not just marijuana, you know, you can grow. <laughs> so, so, this is a, so this is another project that we did, an acre of uh, edible landscaping at a high-end ranch development. And uh, so this is at, uh, near Salida. So during our, our design course, we uh, took a field trip, about 25 people, and we went to the site, and it was leveled, and we started scratching out ideas on the, on the ground. These are some, of, some of these people were our landscape architects and good graphic people. So it was great that we had some really good uh, brain power in here. So we took that, and this is before SketchUp. So we used sandboxes to build our design, our original design, and then we could move it around and change it. And then eventually we put it on a uh, finished uh, nice drawing. And we had blow up drawings and of different things. This is chicken area. This is like the meditation area. This is a, a wine trellis here, grape trellis. Um, the annual gardens in there. Uh, these are different gills. Apples were on this outside. And I, I, I grew out the trees and planted them. They did the uh, they did the rock walls. I came in and planted these trees. They were only three-quarter inch trees after I grew them out. Uh, all full-size trees, standard trees on good rootstock and all the understories in there right now. And then I went back eight years later or six years later and that's what it looked like. That's a, that was one of those little trees there. These, all the trees lived. I think we lost one tree. Uh, and this is gooseberries and you can see a comfrey hollyhock, pretty much the way it looks at my place, and lots of mulch, but and, and keep going. Uh, this is an, another shot of all the apples. Um, and then I went back another, about five years later, and even looked even better. Uh, and I hear that they, they changed ownership and they bulldozed the whole thing. Oh. What? Yeah. I don't know. It's just like priorities, you know. Uh, it was a centerpiece for this big development, and it worked, you know, for 20 years. Go ahead. Too much yeah. work. Yeah, it might have been. They didn't want to hire anybody to maintain it. They finally hired. They thought it was just going to grow on their own, and so on, you know. It was just, it needs, you have to, if, to train the people. That's what's happening with our greenhouse. Greenhouses we build, if we build a greenhouse and we can't train a person, we can't find anybody to maintain it properly. Yeah. That's the grape trellis. That's the grape trellis and the different uh, berries and peaches and plums and pears. And that's the annual garden. There was a clubhouse over here with a nice kitchen and they, pre they prepared a lot of stuff, canned a lot of stuff, pickled a lot of stuff. So it did work for a while. And uh, these are some of our classes. This is, we've been doing the design course now for 31 years. And we have, if you go on our website, we have uh, the academy for eight days and five workshops. And we have lots of other tours and uh, volunteer days and stuff like that. Uh, that, you know, we can, uh, and we'll see the PowerPoint on greenhouses tonight, this afternoon, I guess. And uh, we'll see more indoor forest gardening. So I hope that uh, gave you some idea uh, of what, I have a lot of, more current stuff that I haven't been able to get on um, edited. I have lots of good stuff in the tropical greenhouse. I just did some videoing of Chop Drop when you were there, right? We did some videoing with the father with the... Yeah. yeah. Maybe the Chop Drop too, I don't know. Yeah, we did, I mean, I have these nitrogen fixing trees and we coppiced them all and just brought them down. But that, that process is, you know, no place else in the United States is that happening. Mm -hmm. You don't have any tropical agroforestry in the United States. <laughs> it's the only place in basalt, you know? Like, Who knew? And nobody knows about it. <laughs> it's yeah. in the book, though. It's in the I book. have a question for you. Uh, in terms of starting a food forest, do you usually plant your fruit trees first and then fill in the understory over a period of years after that? Or? I plant them all at one time. But you could start with one thing, like you start with the, the center leader, I call it. Okay. It's like you take, you know, you say your apple tree, your overstory, let's say. And then it's just like coloring by the numbers, right? It's not, 
It's just you fill in the blanks. Yeah. You're just like a color book, you know, like a kid, you know, coloring up this and that and that's that. You know? And you can do that in your design, too. You can just make little cutouts, you know, with colored paper, and you can move them around on your, um, you know, if you don't have SketchUp, you can just move them around on your design with base map, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can just play it in with pencil and then color it in. Um, it's, it's not rocket science for sure. It's just common sense or you have fun. Um, you know, you, you use vertical space. All your fence lines could be, you know, trellis with usable things and gooseberries, uh, jostaberries, all kinds of things could go up on your fence line, grapes, um, uh, goji berries go viral after a couple of years. But everything that can be, everything that gets to be weedy, like goji berries and raspberries, can be dug up and sold in your nursery. So that's how you maintain, you know, the, the order of things and you turn it into another yield. And so my nursery person, she just started selling understory. And she has a whole section in the ravine of all the understory that we sell. 20 different things that's in the understory. Dividing, cuttings, um, and then that's a big sale. That's a big, because people were more apt to buy a little comfrey plant or a little raspberry plant for $4 than they would a tree for $30 or $20. So that's another. Nursery is, a, is, is really a cash cow for any forest garden, for any permaculture site. That's a cash cow. And I've used it mainly as a, as a write-off. When I did it, I usually lost money. Uh, but I always used it as a write-off. So everything that I spent, instead of you know, paying war tax, I would you know, you know, use it as a, a legal write-off. You know? You've mentioned this a few times over, but at what point did you start transitioning towards that entrepreneurial connect? You know, you've, you've made a lot of references towards that, and that entrepreneurial spirit, but also the commodification and the marketing and the, the implications of that. What was your learning process or experience on that front? Well, I started as a market farmer. All of that, and you'll see in the next slide, it was all annual vegetables and herbs for 10 or 15 years. And I just burned myself out. I burned the soils out. Because when you're, when you're doing market farming you, in a short season, you're building compost. It's all gone. You've grown a crop. You've turned it into money. And there's, you start all over again. With forest gardening, you don't start all over again. You're, you, don't take, you only take a third or a quarter or almost nothing back out. You're building soils. That's what carbon farming is about. You're building soils all the time. And you're, you're just not taking it out. But you're taking everything out. You put in this much compost, you're down to nothing again. And that's, what the, that's the struggle for young farmers in cold climates. They never can gain. And they're, you know, they're always stealing and burning out soils. In other climates where you can do intercropping or uh, cover cropping, you, know, you can gain some ground. Intercropping is another Another thing that's really big now, intercropping. Like in Nebraska, they just, you know, they just plant corn. They'll plant three different crops in one season now. It's, but the US, USDA doesn't, it's small farmers that are doing about it. It's catching on a little bit by the NRCS. But there's so much innovation out there that can change uh, the way we're growing food, like in this valley here, which just, you know, there's so many different things. You know, just black medic and wheat. Okay, as a, as, a, as a nurse crop, drilling, you know, no-till winter wheat into black medic. It's a no-brainer, but they'll herbicide it because guess what? They're selling herbicides. Black medic doesn't give uh, Monsanto any money, right. and yeah. you know that's the way. It, but there's all kinds of alternatives that work, and they're out there, and they're just not not catching on. I think that's the, that's the opportunity that we have, I think, to redefine agriculture, again, especially in agricultural communities yeah. where it's already happening. Yeah. Because I've, I've noticed that myself, while the food forest in my garden is just pumping away and rhubarb's getting huge, that, you know, everything's happening, I'm like, 
going crazy in the annual garden, trying to grow seedlings out and do all this stuff, and everything's just happening back there, and I'm not doing anything. And I think that, that if we can introduce agricultural systems that have a perennial component yeah. to them, you know, where you're getting an income from something that doesn't take a lot of... Or you're not putting herbicides in. Right. And, you know, you're covering the ground, saving the soil with, with black medic, fixing nitrogen, and you don't have to use the herbicide. Okay. And so, and, and you're getting, you, yeah. And so there's, those are the, I think those are the opportunities yeah. that we have. You know, agriculture is the problem, but it could also be the solution. We need more, you know, Wendell Bear is always, we need more good examples. Mm -hmm. You know, we need more people that take relationship to the land mm -hmm. and provide good examples for people because, you know, we could talk all day about this, but unless people actually see it, they might, they're not going to kind of mm -hmm. take that risk. Like getting people There's another thing, that it, uh, the machine called a roller crimper, and it's used in the Midwest uh, to, um, to do uh, cover crops of rye and vetch followed by wheat and corn. So they, they do a cover crop of vetch, and this big roller comes out and rolls the vetch down at a certain time, chops it up, kills it, stuns it so much that it doesn't, and there's a drill behind it, and it plants corn right into this much organic matter. So there it is. There's, there's the solution there, and then you do that with wheat, rye, and wheat. Same thing. Yeah, we can do that in our annual gardens as well, but they can do it now. But that doesn't get, that has not gotten much traction either because, again, you know, it's a new technology and there's no funding for it. There's a and, and it's in the public domain. The, the design is in the public domain. Yeah. The roller crimper design is public yeah. domain. Yeah. It's not, it's yeah. not com com copyrighted. So anybody can have it made. Yeah. Meaning that it's not a commercially viable, that's why it hasn't caught on because John Deere doesn't make any money from it. They want to get the fuel down, so they have grants to, if around people who have, you know, dwellings in the forest, which I do, you know, our, our whole mountain is covered with pinion and juniper, and there are trees and houses in there. So if you can mitigate and get the fuel down around your house, cut a fire break, you know, 150 feet at least away from your house, then whatever trees can be limbed up and you get that fuel out of there, either by chipping it, hauling it out, burning it. But I just, I came in and put it on the contour so I could put it back into the soil. And they were kind of upset about that. They'd never seen anything like that. And the woman wasn't one, didn't, she didn't want to give me the money. Uh, you know, because it was something that she'd never seen and she wasn't very happy with. You know, they, they just don't, a lot of times, at least in Colorado, they're not, you know, the NRCS is just not very innovative. In, in Virginia, they're, they're promoting agroforestry and silviculture. They're funding them. So there are different states where the NRCS is, you know, they're, we're still in the dark ages, I think, in Colorado and probably Montana, too, more conservative uh, agencies, you know. Uh, they're starting to come around, but, you know, but that, that was just a, a grant that they were giving anybody, but I just turned it around and made it even more, you know, turned it around and got more bang for my buck, you know. I turned it around and did something else, you know, by putting it into the soil, building swales, and uh, got more, more use out of that wood, and I didn't have to haul it off. Is that your question? Or? Yeah. Well, and again, Nate, invasive weeds, yeah. we, 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 can, we can go into that a little bit. I, sh I gave you the the biocontrol stuff, if you watch my video on natural weed for natural controls for noxious weeds, um, we're bringing goats back into our, into our county again to, to eat thistle. And I brought in, when I was doing the video, I, I had 500 goats brought in on a couple projects I was doing, funded by the county. Uh, Two-year projects that I was doing biocontrol, and it's in the video. And we brought in, they, actually the same woman from Wyoming is hauling in trailer loads of goats and herders and they fence them off and they'll, they do bow control and natural control with goats, you know, along corridors, along railroad tracks, whatever. And, um, 
and it's just, you know, it comes and goes, you know, depends on who's in, uh, who's in power and how much pressure that uh, the, the local people put on um, the different agencies. You know, we used to have two towns that were no spray, and then the herbicide companies fought and fought until they got it back to where it was spraying again, and now we, we're going back and forth. You know, it's one of these tug of war things where you just you have to stay on top of it uh, because they don't want to give up any ground at all. They don't want to see one crack in the armor. You know, because one town says they're not going to spray, somebody else might get that idea. Oh, another town does not going to spray. Another town, okay, it might even catch on. That's not what they want to do.